let's dive in and give you the top 10 ways to actually help smart narcissists in a way that you can do it without backlash, without them like freaking out on you, without you like ending up going, oh my God, how in the heck am I going to do this and actually come out unscathed? Because you know how they are. They end up like flipping their lid, right? I mean, that narcissistic injury gets triggered and that narcissistic rage comes flying out. They want to punish you. They want to make sure that you never do that again. They want to make sure that you stay under their little like finger, their web of control. I was actually just talking to somebody this morning and they were like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to escape. This person I was talking to this morning is living with it for 30 years and you know, just now trying to figure out how to escape plotting and planning and making sure that she does it the right way in outsmarting the narcissist. And that's what I'm going to do. So by the end of this video, you're going to have 10 and I'm going to start with number 10 and we're going to work our way backwards so that you stay all the way to the end to get number one. Ready? Number 10. Number 10 is don't take the bait. Okay. So they want you to take the bait. That's what they do. I mean, I remember dealing with a family member who was a narcissist and, you know, he would be like, you, you get into it with them and he'd be like, yeah, now we're having a conversation. I mean, he wanted you to get into the mud with them. And once you're down in that mud, that's when they feel like now they have you, right? So when they get emotional and they get you to get emotional, then they know that they've got you into that, that vortex. They're pulling you in. And when they freak out and you freak out and you match their level, you're in it. So when you, when they go here and you stay here and you stay calm, you've outsmarted them because they don't know how to do that. They're, they're trying to pull you in and you haven't, you haven't taken the bait. So that's number 10. That's one of the ways that you can definitely outsmart them, All right? Number nine. Number nine, and this is especially when you're negotiating with them because that's my specialty, that's my sweet spot, that's my superpower. That's what one of the things I love to do is negotiate. And that is to throw out a decoy, okay? So when you're in the thick of it and you're trying to negotiate with them, whether it's a business deal, partnership, client, divorce, whatever it is, it could be in your own household. Who knows? Maybe it's you know, a teenager. I mean, I've been coaching uh, somebody who's been dealing with a, a huge family issue with regard to probate litigation matter. Throw out a decoy for what it is that you actually want, because if they know what you actually want, then they're going to make it their mission to make sure that that's the thing that you don't actually get because why because they get supply from jerking you around remember right you know the end goal for them is not resolution the end goal for them is supply they get supply from jerking you around and intimidating you so you can throw out a decoy and then you can kind of fit in what it is that you actually want down the road, but you're sort of throwing it into a package and you, you sort of figure out a way to strategically place it in so that you end up getting what you want, but maybe they don't necessarily know that you're ending up getting what you want. See what I mean? All right. Number eight. Number eight is asking for more than, than what you want. This is again in a negotiation. You're going to figure out what it is that you want, and then you're going to ask for way more than that, so much that they end up going, mm, F you, I'm out of here. I mean, that's kind of a strategy for any kind of negotiation, by the way. You are going to ask for more than what you want and kind of back your way down, but never so much that you are going to make the other person so angry. But that's definitely something that you can do. All right, number seven. Number seven is, I, I like this one. I like number seven because 
it's, it's a way for you to kind of disengage. Number seven is just observe their behavior to them. So you're looking at them and you're kind of going, I can see that you're angry. You're almost like you have to pretend almost like you have a microphone in your hand and you're reporting the news. I see that you are upset. I see you being angry. You kind of like look at them and you can almost observe their behavior to them. And it, it starts to disarm them when you do that because you're actually validating them. You are actually noticing them and empathizing with them and giving them attention, which is something that they want. They want to be seen. All people like to be seen, heard, and validated. That's just part of being human. And so that actually helps to start to disarm them. And actually, I have a a little lot more on that in my video um, called Phrases that disarm narcissists, which you can check out if you'd like. But, you know, you just kind of observe their behavior to them almost as if you are a third party. And it helps you to disengage as well, by the way. All right, so that's number seven. We are working our way down to number one. Number six. Number six is you don't defend yourself. When you start getting into... I never said that. I never did that. Oh, how can you say that about me? I'm a great mom. I'm a wonderful father. Look at all the ways that I contributed to this business. Look at all the wonderful things that I've done. If you're really dealing with a true narcissist, the chances of them going, oh my God, you are right. Oh, yes, you have done all of those wonderful things. I I am the wrong one. That is not going to happen. You know, that's not going to happen. So you're just like wasting your breath and your air, you know? So when they criticize you, you can just look at them and you go, wow, someone got up on the wrong side of the bed or something like that. I mean, I remember having a family member one time who was like really upset about something and came over and like accused me of something like that was like completely preposterous. She was like fighting with her husband and I wasn't even involved in the situation at all. But then she just like came over to me and went, and you blah, 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 blah. And I just remember looking at her and and I went, you know, traveling with children is so stressful. Like I just like didn't even allow it to like come on to me at all. And I didn't, I didn't even take it on. And so when they do that, you just don't defend yourself and it really will help you so much. You just never try to explain, you know, defend or, or justify. It really will help you. And that actually brings me into number five, which number five is never explain or justify anything you do. Kind of goes with number six was never, which is never defend. Number five is never explain or justify. So You never try to go, oh, well, I did this and I did that. Justify yourself. I mean, it's just, again, it's sort of like defending. You're kind of giving credence to them. You're you're lending uh, validation to things that they're saying, and that's what they want. You're getting into the mud. You're getting emotional. Again, you're giving them supply by doing that, right? So you don't need to do that. And number four, we're working our way down to number one here. So stick with me. Number four is to create leverage, which is all part of my slay methodology. L is leverage. S is strategy. Create leverage and then never give it away too early. So you you do want to create leverage, which I'm going to give you a little hint with narcissists, leverage is always going to be tied up and somehow looking at their forms of narcissistic supply because that's the only thing that ever motivates a narcissist. You know, like with other humans, they are motivated by lots of different things, but with narcissists, they're really only ever motivated by one thing. Now, it may be different ways that they get narcissistic supply. There's definitely a hierarchy of supply, but they're only ever motivated by 
supply. So remember, create leverage and then don't give it away too early. So that's number four. Number three is remember that everything that you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. So be really, really careful about that. You want to make sure that you are not like putting yourself in a position where they, you've given them something that they can use against you because they will, you know, you get angry, you put something in there and now that you've got something, right? You don't want to have to be on that defensive, right? You want to be on the offensive. You want to be in a position where you can fight back. And by the way, if you're so ready to fight back, give me a fight back in the comments right now, fight back. Just remember that everything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. Don't put anything in writing that they can potentially use against you. And number two, number two, we're working our way up to the number one way that you can outsmart the narcissist. But number two is in that same vein, remember that everything that you are doing, and it's kind of really closely related to everything, put your hand to, but everything you're doing, they're going to try to use everything you do or say against you. Like, remember dealing with a narcissist is like getting arrested. They're going to try to goad you. They're going to try to use everything. They're going to try to use everything you do or say against you. They're going to like trick you. They're going to try to catch you and, and even watch for ulterior motives. I mean, even if they're being nice, they're love bombing you, they're hoovering you, they're uh, like, you know, they're doing all these things. Watch for ulterior motives because, you know, you really can't trust them. Sorry to say. All right. So that's number two. Ready for number one? The number one way to outsmart a narcissist. Ready? Go no contact. Heal. Don't look in the rear view mirror. Wipe them from the CPU of your life. Say bye bye. And like, that's the worst thing that you could possibly do to them is actually no longer care what they're doing because you're no longer giving them supply and you've moved on and, and you've, and you've healed. Like that's the one thing that they really don't want because you're no longer like affected by them at all. Okay. So you're dealing with a narcissist and you're like, what in the heck do I do? Because you constantly feel like maybe you're like a turtle on, on your, on your back and they've got their foot on your, on the front, on your belly. Right. Because why? Because narcissists are street fighters. That's what they are. They are the, uh, uh, if they were in a ring with you, they would be pulling your hair, biting you, pinching you, kicking you in the groin. That's what they do. There's no bar that's too low except the one that maybe they think might expose them or something like that. But a lot of times they mistake even like going too far for that, you know, people will respect them more in some way or whatever. So that's the problem that you're dealing with here. I mean, a lot of times you are under the mistaken impression that you're both looking for a resolution and, and you're thinking in your mind because you're the reasonable person over there, what is it that they want? Let me just give it to them so I can be out of this thing or, you know, or we can walk away and I can have peace in my life or maybe they won't be mad at me or maybe I won't unleash the fire in them. You know, if I hang back, if I'm, if I, if I don't ruffle feathers, then you know, it'll be better for me. But how's that going for you? Let me just ask you that question. How is that going for you? Probably not so good. You're probably still in hell. They're probably still doing things to try to make you miserable that are actually making you miserable, that are causing drama, trauma, and chaos, right? So even hanging back and trying not to ruffle feathers, that ain't working. Okay, so there is a way that you can do this. You can fight back. You can do it in a way that's super strategic, but you have to be really, really smart about it. Okay, because here's the thing. They're always trying to trigger you. 
they're always trying to goad you and they're expecting that by saying the right things, pushing the right buttons, you know, jamming uh, sticks into your weaknesses, that you're going to respond. And once you respond, then now we're, we've got it going here because now they're getting narcissistic supply from that response. And that's what they're addicted to. They're addicted to narcissistic supply. And if they're not going to get it from you in the form of your adulation and you doing things for them or making them look good in some way, or, you know, there's some other uh, value that they're getting out of the situation, then they're going to get it. They're going to get it from you in a different way. And how that's going to look is intimidating you, making you uh, scared, you know, controlling you, goading you, degrading you, debasing you, all of those things. That, and they get supply from that as well. And remember that they are supply whores. I mean, they're going to get it however they can get it. And if there's any little bit to get out of it, like, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel, they're still going to be there looking for it, whoring for it. I mean, they'll dumpster dive for it, no matter how they, how bad they need, you know, it gets, they're going to be there trying to get that supply out of you as long as there's something to be had. Uh, and, you know, they trigger you in all different sorts of ways, including things that they say to you. And if you want to know more about narcissist favorite sayings, definitely check out my video on that. But they expect you to be the victim. They expect you to be a certain way because they've probably conditioned you for a while. I mean, unless it's a a business situation, then they can kind of smell that blood too if you are hesitant in how you interact with them. And the longer that they see that you're a victim or feel it or smell it or sense it in any way, the more they will continue to come back and try to target every single weakness that you have it really will never end. It's like Barney, that this is the song that never ends because as long as there's something to be had, they're going to be there. So, and that's why it seems like you can never get away from them. That's why the fight never ends. So how you outsmart them is not fighting back with exactly what they do, you know, coming out and trying to one-up them on degrading or debasing or one-up them on, you know, slinging mud. That's, that just gives them supply. That's not the way to outsmart them. That's the way to give them exactly what it is that they want. You're never going to get anywhere with that, ever, ever, ever. So it's finding those ways to build that invisible fence around them to eventually motivate and squeeze them using strategy, using leverage, anticipating what they're going to do, focusing on you and your position. That's my my slay methodology, and that's what works. That's what's proven. So if you don't want to continue to give them narcissistic supply, uh, then you got to figure out a way to outsmart them. So how do you outsmart them? So number one, number one is stop feeling like you need to respond to every single thing they say or do. You know, a lot of times you find yourself, you get these long text messages or these long emails or or they just say things to you and you feel like you need to go through and categorically respond to every single thing. Oh, you think I'm a horrible mother? Well, I just picked Johnny up from school today and I helped him with his homework and I took him to baseball and then I fed him dinner. Like, how does that make me a horrible mother? But that's exactly what they want because now they have you now there you are upset feeling defensive right so how you can stop yourself especially if you get long texts or long emails or those you know filled with vitriol things i want you to learn how to uh, strategically respond and tactically respond all you have to do is look through the email or look through the text and find the one thing that you need to respond to, like what time are we meeting on Wednesday or whatever it is, and respond to that. And that's the only thing you need to respond to. As to the rest of it, you can just say, I'm in receipt of your 
correspondence and I deny your allegations. That's all you need to say. You don't need to go through every single one and prove yourself because you know what? You never will. It's not like you're, you're, you're going to get them to go, oh, geez, you're right. I, you are a wonderful mother. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen that way. They're never going to go, oh, yeah, you're not going to convince them. So where are you going with it? Think about what your end goal is. Um, if it's to try to convince them, you might as well go hit your head against the brick wall. Ain't going to happen. But remember that every text and every writing and anything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. So you can just respond strategically, respond to the things that you need to respond to, and that's it. So that's number one. Number two is disengage emotionally. The more emotion that they can trigger in you, the more they can goad you into being upset or angry or sad, or that gives them supply. So the more you can pull back and start to disengage emotionally and start almost looking at the situation as if you're a bystander who's reporting the news, the more you are now starting to outsmart them, the less supply they are getting from, that, from you. From and from the situation. All right. Does this make sense? If this makes sense, I want to see an outsmart them in the comments right now. Just go below and write outsmart them because that is what you are doing. All right. So number three is use decoys to throw them off the scent of what you really want, especially in negotiations, because whatever it is that you really want, if they sense that, then that will become their personal mission to make sure that you don't get it. Okay. So, you know, maybe act like you don't care about certain things that you really care about, or that you care about certain things that you wouldn't matter to you as much if, if you got in the negotiations. And that way, at the end of the day, when you're walking away, if they think that they got you in some way, now they're none the wiser and you actually were able to outsmart them. Remember, you're not going to win by like showing them that you've won because as long as they think that, then they're going to keep going, keep going, keep going. So outsmarting them is you winning and they think that they got something out of the situation. Um, and the last one is creating leverage. And I've talked about this a lot of times. Make sure that when you're creating leverage, you're creating leverage within the context of an overall strategy. It's really, really important. You have to decide when you're going to use it, how you're going to use it, where you're going to use it, all those things. Um, but you're basically, as I said, building that invisible fence and you are ethically manipulating the manipulator by threatening a source of supply that means more to them to keep than the supply that they get from making you miserable. And there are four things you really need to know if you're dealing with a narcissist, okay? Listen to me. First of all, I took them from Al-Anon. First three are what they call the three C's, and then there's going to be one more. So the three C's are that you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. So let's take them one by one. You didn't cause this. You didn't cause their narcissism. They're going to try to blame it all on you. They brought you into their world. They made you feel like you were the one who was the most special person ever, whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, or even if they're your parent or whatever, here you were brought into their world and they make you feel like you're supposed to be, you know, the most special person, but you didn't cause that. Something else caused them to feel inadequate in some way. Think about it. Something happened to them in their childhood that caused a disconnect within them. They're the ones that have this emptiness inside of them. It's like a black hole that can't be filled. And so they're walking around the world trying to fill this hole from external sources all the time. And you are just this collateral damage in a way because you happen to be there. And so they're looking to you to try to fill this. You're just a 
food source, really, a supply source, and you're over there trying to fill it for them because they they make you feel like you're supposed to be able to do that for them. But you didn't cause that. Something else caused that long before you came along. So you didn't cause that. And so you can't take that personally. You know, how people feel, how people treat other people is always a direct reflection of the way they feel about themselves. It never has anything to do with you. So you can't take that personally. If people treat each other well, it's because they feel whole and complete or they feel good about themselves inside. It has nothing to do with you. And, you know, I always say that one of my favorite books is The Four Agreements. Highly recommend that book, The Four Agreements. And it's four agreements that you make with yourself. And one of the agreements is that you never take anything personally because the way people treat other people is, is a direct reflection of the way they feel about themselves. So number one is you, you didn't cause it. So the next one is you can't control it. You can't control other people. You can only control yourself. You can control how you're going to react you can certainly control how you are going to react to them. And you can control how you're going to take care of yourself. And I have a whole video on self-care when you're dealing with a narcissist. And I definitely watch that video, self-care, when you're dealing, when you're coping with a narcissist. Definitely check out that video. In fact, I have a whole video series on self-care when you're coping with a narcissist. You can even check out the whole video series on that. Definitely check that out. Take care of yourself. And, and in fact, I want you to put that in the comments right now. I take care of myself. I take care of myself because that's what I want you to start thinking of right now. You didn't cause it. You can't control it. Those are the first two C's. And the last one is you can't cure it. And then there's going to be one more. So make sure you keep watching till the end. You can't cure it. They can't cure themselves. I've done videos. I've actually interviewed many different therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists even, who said you can't, you can't cure narcissists. And in fact, I've actually even talked to mental health professionals who've said they won't even treat narcissists because they can't be cured. They don't even want anything to do with narcissists because they can't be cured. So you certainly aren't going to cure the narcissist. Don't sit around waiting for that. You're just going to hurt yourself. You're just going to cause yourself more pain, more trouble. So you can't cure them, all right? You didn't cause it. You can't control it. You're not going to cure them. What can you do? This is, this is your fourth rule, your fourth thing to know about narcissists. And that is that you can slay. You can use my slay methodology. You can walk away. You can slay it. You can shift the dynamic. You can win at the negotiation. You absolutely can. Everyone else is telling you that you can't win against narcissists. I'm telling you that with the right strategies, with the right understanding of how narcissists think, that you absolutely can win every single time. You can. You absolutely can. Don't give up. Don't be fatalistic. Don't allow yourself to be a victim. Don't allow it. Make sure that you have done what you need to do to do your self-care, to join things like my free private Facebook group, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. Many people in there who are supporting each other. If you are negotiating with a narcissist, grab my free Crush My Negotiation Prep Worksheet, totally free ebook, 15 pages. Go to crushmydeal.com. Get that. It's a totally free ebook that many thousands of people have won their entire negotiations on. So get that, crushmydeal.com. Subscribe to this channel. Hit that notification bell. If you need additional support, go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung for therapy if you need that. It's a partnership that I have with BetterHelp to get you the additional support that you need. We do receive commissions. It doesn't 
cost you any more. We just have a partnership with them so that you can get the help and support that you need. We only recommend services that we trust. So if you are dealing with that pesky, awful, toxic narcissist, and you are just at your wit's end, and you're trying to figure out how to outsmart them, here are five secrets to outsmarting them. Number one, agree with them. And I know what you're saying, what? Agree with them? They're crazy, they're pathological liars. They say anything they want to. They accuse me of stuff that's not true. I get it, I do. I've dealt with them, I've represented them, I've had them on the other side of my cases. I've had to deal with them in my own life. So, I mean, nobody's immune, narcissists are everywhere, right? But I'm talking about ways that you can bring them down. They, you know, because remember that a narcissist's game is to manipulate you. I mean, you think it's to beat you, but it really isn't. Beating you isn't the outcome. There's really no outcome. They don't really have a goal or an outcome. Their outcome is just manipulating you, messing with you, making themselves look as good as possible. And the only way that they can make themselves look good is by putting you down. And so if you steal their thunder, if you take their, their ammunition away, then they don't know what to do with that. So you just say, you know, if they say to you, you're always late, just say, you know what, you're right. I'm always late. Um, and, and they're going to, you know, bristle at that at first. Oh, you're being, um, you know, you're talking down to me, condescending, whatever. Um, you know, they can say whatever you want. Just say, no, I'm, I'm always late. That's what you say. I'm always late. You know, and you're, you're not saying it in a, be careful not to say it in a way that's um, sarcastic or, where you, you know, they can tell that they're getting to you because the whole purpose of this is to just show them that you're, you're not affected, that you're completely nonplussed by the, what they're saying and, and how they're saying it. You know, that's their perspective. You're always late, whatever. Um, and they, they'll, they'll be thrown off their game with that. Okay. Now the one little caveat I will say is if you're going to court with a narcissist, you definitely don't want to say this like in a deposition or in court or something like that. I mean, this is where you're just having a conversation with this other person and you're just coming up with ways to um, outsmart them and, and, and kind of beat them at their own game. So by them trying to manipulate you by getting a rise out of you and you just saying you're right, it, it, it stuns them. They're, they're not quite sure what to do with that. Okay. So that's number one. Number two is the ear method. Uh, this comes from Bill Eddy, who is an author an attorney and a psychologist, and he's written books like splitting and Biff and the five types of people that'll ruin your life. And um, he says you use ear statements. And this is especially true if you've got somebody who's just completely out of control and just losing their mind on you. You, sh you show empathy, attention, and respect. Ear, E-A-R. And I know what you're thinking. You don't want to show them empathy, attention, or respect because you don't empathize with them. You don't want to give them attention. And you certainly don't respect them. I get it. This is to outsmart the narcissist, remember? So... You know, if you act the way the narcissist expects you to act, then they know they have you. If you act in a way that they don't expect you to act, just like in number one, where we said, just agree with them, this is where you're giving them a little bit of attention. And remember, that's what the narcissist wants. They want attention. So you're just giving them just enough to say, you know, I see that you're upset. Um, you know, it must be difficult to travel or whatever it is that you want to say to them, but you're just saying it without emotion. Um, just show them a little bit of empathy, attention, and respect. And if you're dealing with a narcissist in your life, just put yes in the comments. Okay, number three thing you can do is figure out leverage against them. Even if you're not negotiating with them in a formal sense, figuring out a way that you can gather 
around them and, and find their inconsistencies and figure out what it is that they're saying that they're lying about, catch them in their lies. Now, what I want you to do when you're doing this, though, is not show them right away what you've got, because if you're showing it to them real time, real time, real time, then they're constantly out gaming you, which they're very good at. I mean, narcissists are master manipulators, especially covert narcissists. Covert narcissists are great at looking really, really wonderful to 99% of the world. I know I've had to deal with them myself. And if you want to know more about covert narcissists, make sure that you check out my video on covert narcissism in relationships. And I will definitely drop a link to that video below. But in the meantime, while you're gathering leverage and you're gathering motivation for them to want to um, have a conversation with you or do what you want them to do, um, you're just gathering, 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 and you're using, you're waiting to use that leverage at a time that is most opportune for you. And that the, the, the time that you're going to use that is when you have them fully surrounded and there's no, you know, it's like airtight. It's like um, soldiers that are surrounding a city or something like that. There's no escaping because that's when they go crazy and their true colors really show through which again is more leverage that you'll be able to potentially use down the road. Okay, number four is throw them off the scent. So what I mean by this is don't show a narcissist what you really want because the minute you tell them what it is that you definitely don't want or you definitely do want, then that's the thing that they're going to do whatever they can to make sure you don't get it because you know, if you're trying to outsmart a narcissist here, you don't show your hand. You don't show what it is that you want. You throw them off the scent. You know, you, you, you act like nonchalant about the thing that you really want the most. And then the thing that you don't care about, you act like that's the most important thing ever. And especially if you're negotiating with a narcissist, this is very, very critical. I have a video on how to negotiate with a narcissist, and I will drop a link to that below. Check that out if you're trying to negotiate with a narcissist. But regardless if you're trying to negotiate or not, you're still in a negotiation if you're having to deal with this narcissist. So don't show them what it is that means the most to you because that's what they will then target. Because then in the end, if you end up with what you want, who really cares if they knew that that was what you want? And if they think that you didn't get what you wanted, you know, act like, oh my gosh, this was just horrible or whatever. And then, you know, when you go back to your house or you go back to your room or whatever, you can just be like Dr. Evil and squeal and ha 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 ha, and you know, you got what you wanted. So who really cares if he or she knew that they, that you got what you wanted. Okay. And number five has nothing to do with the narcissist at all. It has everything to do with you. And in my book, Negotiate Like You Matter, and in my programs, you'll, you know, those of you who've worked with me or those of you who've read my book, that the most important thing is your internal feeling of value. So you focus on your own power, you focus on your own value, and your own internal feeling of value. Remember that narcissists have no internal feeling of value. They get all their feeling of any sort of value from the external. And the more you can just be that oak tree and that you can just stand in your power, the less the, the narcissist will get to you. And that is really the best way to outsmart that narcissist. I definitely would try to get that narcissist out of your world if you possibly can. I always say show them the door to your world. Have a nice life. But obviously, if you're co-parenting with a narcissist and, you know, you're still going to have to have them in your world, you know, do something like parallel parenting, something where you don't have to deal with them on a regular basis. Okay. So now the narcissist likes to ignore you. It's called ghosting sometimes. Why do they do this? Well, they come on, they come on with this love bombing. They, 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 oh my God, you're the most incredible person they've ever met. They're amazing. And then, oh, oh my God, where did they go? Yeah, well, you know, they're ignoring you. They're ghosting you. 
it's all meant to manipulate you. It's part of there's this game that they play. They play this game and they do it during negotiations, especially because they're trying to play with your brain, play with your mind. They like to play games. They're trying to manipulate you. They want you to beg for attention. You're basically dealing with a two-year-old. They're, they're two-year-olds in adult bodies. That's what they are. They're toddlers. They look like grownups, but they're really toddlers inside, okay? It's a way to get what we call narcissistic supply. They want you to pay attention to them. They want you to beg, you know? So that's what's going on. And so I'm going to give you some tips and tricks and things. I know it's going to drive you insane, when they ignore you. So these are the things that you're going to do when they're trying to make you go crazy. So here's what you're going to do instead. And, you know, especially during the negotiations, you know, they're going to do these things. So number one, I'm going to tell you this as a lawyer, number one, if there's a case going on, if it's an active case, whether it's a divorce case or some kind of civil case, some kind of other case, you have to send them something, some kind of communication just to preserve the case, just to let them know something because you're, you're trying to communicate because you have to communicate because maybe you have children, whatever, then you can send them something just to communicate. They're not communicating. You can say, I know you're not communicating with me right now, but I'm letting you know that this is what's happening. I'm keeping you updated on Johnny's progress, Susie's progress, whatever it is. You do your part because you have to sometimes, or maybe you're supposed to be updating on something that's happening with the business or whatever it is. You do your part, just make sure you're preserving the record, just make sure it's in writing. So that's number one, you do your thing, you do what you have to do. If you have to, just the facts, you know, as I say all the time, just the facts, ma'am or sir, whatever. Don't add anything emotional, don't say, hey, you know, you're a piece of crap for not responding to me because all that does is give them that supply that they want. Cause you know, they're doing this to manipulate you. Right. So, you know, so that's number one. Number two is do not beg for the attention. Don't say, please pay attention to me. Don't be clingy. Don't be desperate. It, you know, even if they're your best friend, they're your business partner, your soon to be ex, whatever it is, do not be clingy. Keep your composure. You know, if it's your mom, your dad, your sibling, I don't care who it is. Do not beg. That is what they want. Do not give it to them. Do not let that narcissist see that they've hurt you. You know, that old com commercial, don't let them see you sweat. You do not let them see you sweat. That is exactly what they want. Do not give that to them. All right. So that's number two. Number three, you just keep on going with your daily routine, whatever it is, you just keep on going. Do not obsess over them. I'm going to give you a little mantra right now. Don't obsess with the narcissist, plan your success. Don't obsess, plan your success. Put that in the comments. Don't obsess, plan your success. Success is the best revenge, right? Don't obsess, plan your success. Next, number four. Talk to people that care about you instead. Remember, the narcissist does not care about you. They only care about themselves. Talk to people that care about you instead of spending all day worrying about the narcissist. And definitely don't go on social media. Don't, you know, obsess over them or their minions or little flying monkeys or whatever. Don't do things that are going to make you crazy. Next. Do something that's going to take your mind off of it, you know, maybe get a hobby, plan something, do something creative, start writing that book you've always wanted to write. Take your mind off of yourself, you know, maybe volunteer at a women's shelter or a children's function or do something that's going to take your mind off of it. Something that's going to make you look forward to, you know, so that your head's not going to explode, right? start a project, something for work, something that's going to have you be creative. 
You know, that was something that really was helpful for me when I was dealing with the narcissist in my life. You know, when I realized that I was in creation mode, it was so much better than being in victim mode, being in victim mode and being in victor mode, very different destinations, stay in victor mode, way better destination, much better path. Okay. Take care of yourself. You know, like that's Victor mode is a place where you're taking care of yourself. And, you know, I do have a whole video on self-care to cope with narcissists. And you can definitely check that out if you'd like. So next is, you know, give yourself space, ignore them, ignore them back. You know, other than like what I said at the beginning, like if you have to send them some note because you have to, because you're supposed to be updating them on what's going on with the children or, you know, you have a business together and you need to update them on something like that. Ignore them back. You know, they're doing this for attention. That's what they're doing. They want you to go, oh, please, uh," you know, don't do that. Just ignore them back. Don't give into their demands or their threats. It's only going to encourage them to do it again. So just don't do that. Okay. You know, like I said, don't obsess, plan your success so much better. So if you're dealing with a narcissist, be it a covert narcissist, a grandiose narcissist, or a malignant narcissist, they, they engage in all kinds of behaviors, even while you are just in a relationship with them, they're gaslighting you, they're lying to you, they're manipulating you. Um, you know, perhaps even being abusive, more than, more than likely they're being abusive. Um, some are sneakier at it than others. Covert narcissists in particular are very sneaky at it. And so if you are dealing with a covert narcissist, I have several videos on, co- on covert narcissists, including why covert narcissists are dangerous and the covert passive aggressive narcissist. And you're going to want to check out those videos. Uh, for sure, if you're dealing with covert narcissists, but whatever kind of narcissist you're dealing with, they are being their narcissist selves the entire time that you're in a relationship with them. So there are different. There are three phases to a narcissistic relationship: it's love bombing, devaluing, and discarding. And remember that the the phases of the relationship don't actually happen in a linear fashion. They happen at uh, the same time sometimes. They can be devaluing you while they're love bombing you. And in fact, there was a study done by a psychologist with monkeys that showed that if monkeys were given a reward for doing something good every single time, nothing happened in their brain. But if they were only given a reward intermittently, variably where the monkeys couldn't predict when they were going to get this reward, the the dopamine levels in their brain actually rose to the level of someone on cocaine. And that's what happens with a relationship with narcissists. They go back and forth, the narcissists go back and forth between love bombing and devaluing and love bombing and devaluing. And so you are left with almost being addicted to in a physiological way to wanting their praise, to wanting their, that love bomb because they start out so charming and they really try to set themselves up to be the perfect person for you and hold out all these things that they're going to do for you or um, even do things for you right at that time. I mean, if you ever watched the Dirty John miniseries, you you recall that that guy was just setting himself to be per- up to be perfect for this successful single businesswoman. He was getting her dry cleaning and making smoothies for her in the morning and all these things at the same time that he was isolating her from her family and uh, turning people against her. So um, you know, they go through these phases of the relationship. So what happens when you are doing battle with a narcissist is they just become that same person, but on steroids. So it's so much worse. They turn up the heat because unfortunately for narcissists, 
you know, you're either for them or you're against them. They need an endless amount of supply. And if you are cutting off that supply to them, then they um, just see you as the enemy. Um, and for those of you who watch my videos on a regular basis, you know that I've had to work two covert narcissists out of my life, and it was not an easy thing. It wasn't husbands, but it was people that were close to me and close enough to do serious damage and cause lots and lots of trauma. And, you know, I'm telling you that if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. Um, narcissists have a symbiotic relationship with empaths. And, you know, narcissists see that empaths have the qualities that they want. And empaths, you know, we just think that we can love everybody back to health and, um, you know, that we have enough love to give and it just ends up being this black hole. And so they, they literally, you know, they're often called energy vampires or leeches or parasites or whatever, but they do, they literally suck the life out of you. And it's almost like, death by a thousand cuts. And so when you go to do battle with a narcissist, they're literally um, <laughs> turning up the heat because now you're the enemy. Now you no longer have any value for them. So there's no, like a reasonable person, those of us who are in reasonable land, we think, oh, we can just walk away and wish each other well, and we'll come up with an agreement that's um, reasonable and hey, the law provides for uh, certain things, you know, depending on what kind of battle you're doing with a narcissist. But um, you can't, that's not how it goes with a narcissist. So if you're getting ready to do battle or you're in the trenches of doing battle with a narcissist, there are a few things that you can do to beat them at their own game and preserve your own sanity along the way. The first thing is don't allow them to disrespect you. When you allow them to disrespect you, you're basically giving them permission to do that. And um, they know how to push your buttons, let me tell you. I mean, especially if you've been in a long-term relationship with this person, they've studied you, they know exactly what your weaknesses are, and so that's where they're gonna go. They're going right there to, um, to, to try to make you look as bad as possible. Everything you say or do is going to be turned against you, used against you, twisted, manipulated. So what you're going to have to do is just maintain your own level of dignity, maintain your own level of respect and demand respect from them. If they are screaming, yelling, trying to talk to you in a way that's overly emotional, um, and they're not in control, they want you to be out of control too because they get supply, they get narcissistic supply by seeing you squirm. So by just maintaining that, hey, we're not gonna have this conversation, you're not being respectful to me, this is not productive, we'll have this conversation when you can be respectful to me. Um, you know, same thing if they are lighting you up in text messages or lighting you up in emails, um, and saying all sorts of disrespectful things, you can just simply respond and say, uh, I disagree with what you're saying. Um, please do not speak to me that way. It is disrespectful. And, you know, and then respond to the parts of it that you might have to respond to, like, what time are you picking up the kids or something like that. But other than that, you're not going to get into the trenches with them and uh, sling that same sort of mud. You're going to demand respect from them and you're going to condition them that that's, this is how it's going to go. If you, if they want you to interact with them, they're going to have to respect you and it's going to drive them insane when you do that. Believe me. Okay. The next thing that you can do is document, document, document. And we cannot say this enough. Those of us who are in this field and professionals in this area, uh, it, it just, you just never know what's going to end up being your leverage. And when you're dealing with narcissists, you have to have a super strong strategy and you have to be able to create leverage. And, um, you know, I often hear people ask me, what is leverage? What does that look like? And leverage can be a smoking gun, 
like the one thing that for sure the narcissist doesn't want anyone to know. Um, or it could be something like that the narcissist is more motivated to resolve your differences than you are, or it can be a, 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 an accumulation of things. It can be, you know, 15 different text messages that show um, that they're a liar, or it, and, and you create an exhibit that shows that. Um, you know, it could be that they didn't show up for picking up the kids on time 20 times in a row, or they changed the schedule every single time that they were supposed to take the kids or whatever. But, you know, it could be any accumulation of those things. And so it's really, really important to do that documentation, even if it seems mundane, you know, just keep the app open on your, you know, on your phone, the notes app, um, or there's apps where you can actually, they, pay, you know, to have a documentation feature or whatever. But basically, you just don't really know what's going to be the pattern that you're going to be able to bring out or what's going to be that leverage. And, you know, for sure, the leverage is always going to be around what is their biggest motivation, which is, um, you know, the one thing they don't want to come out. They, it's going to be around their ego because the thing about narcissists is, you know, they're just always in this um, mode of self-preservation. They're actually very easy to figure out. Um, and narcissists are the most afraid, most scared little personalities on the planet. They have fragile egos because they have no sense of inner value. Um, all of their value comes from the external so uh, when you are looking at your documentation and figuring out what your leverage is, um, you're going to want to think about what is their biggest motivation? What is it that they really don't want brought out? Um, and what is it that's going to make them look bad? Because narcissists do not want to look bad, especially in front of people that they really respect. So if somebody is involved that they really respect, such as a mediator or other lawyers or the judge, especially the judge, um, they're not going to want to look bad. So document, document, document everything. Okay. You never know when you're going to need it. If this is all sounding really good to you so far, and you are so ready to start doing the things that I'm telling you to do, give me an amen in the comments. Okay. The third thing that you can do is figure out what kind of narcissist you're dealing with and understand what behaviors each one uh, engages in. So there, some of it is similar. Um, all narcissists engage in certain types of behaviors like gaslighting and manipulation, but they do it in subtly different ways depending on the type of narcissist that you're dealing with, whether it's covert, malignant, or grandiose. And um, you will want to brush up on the different types of narcissists so that you can figure out what kind you're dealing with and then find out what behaviors they engage in. And once you do that, then um, you will expect it. You're going to go, oh, there, there's that person being that covert narky self. That's what they do. Uh, and you won't take it as personally because you'll just understand that that's the way they act. Okay. So the third thing you can do is figure out what kind of narcissist you're dealing with, brush up on the types of behaviors associated with each narcissist, and then expect them to act like themselves. They don't change. Narcissists do not change. Um, they can pretend like they know. Like, I mean, they're, they're very good at pretending. Um, they do know what good behavior looks like. Um, that's how they were able to rope you in in the first place, and that's how they parade around the world and get people to think that um, they're so great, um, especially covert narcissists are really, really good at that. Um, but you're going to want to figure out what kind you're dealing with and then not be surprised when they just act like themselves. Okay, the fourth thing is when you are getting ready to ask for something from the narcissist, you're going to want to ask for way more than what you actually want. 
the narcissist is going to want to feel like they beat you, like they got to you because they get supply from that. Their egos won't allow you to win, at least on paper. So if you are ready to just give them a certain amount, give away a certain amount that you control, that you decide ahead of time, I'm going to be willing to take this much or I'll be willing to give up this thing. Um, but act like it's like the one thing you definitely don't want to give up. Because if there's something that's super important to you, then that's the one thing that they're going to want to make sure that you don't get. So you're, you, you're kind of playing a game here. And I call it ethically manipulating the manipulator. But basically, you're going to want to give them um, certain things that you kind of decide ahead of time that you, you were willing to give. and then. Um, you know, work back to what you actually want. And then when you get there, you have to act like, oh my God, I can't believe I had to give up so much and this is just awful. And, oh, you, you really took advantage of me and whatever, but you can just go home and smile and pour your champagne or whatever and do it in the privacy of your own home after you've won the things that you wanted. And number five, the last one is, I take it from like this old commercial, never let them see you sweat, but really you never want to let them see you sweat, cry, get emotional, lose control. Then they get supply from that. Um, if you need to, you know, cry in the bathroom um, and, and then come back out, splash water on your face. You know, if you wear makeup and you're a female, whatever, you know, put makeup back on. Uh, if you're a guy, just splash water in your face, comb your hair, whatever you need to do to just maintain control and never let them see that they are getting under your skin. Because as soon as they see that, then they know they have you. Um, if you know you're going to have to interact with them, you know, it, and let's say it's a school meeting or it's a mediation or something like that, don't get there too early, get there on time. Um, don't give them opportunities to grab you and try to manipulate you because that's when they'll start to get under your skin again. Remember what I said at the beginning, these narcissists, they know how to uh, push your buttons. So never let them see you sweat. So let's talk about whether or not you should use the word narcissist in court. The short answer is probably not. There could be times that you could use the word narcissist in court, but for the most part, what you want to do is use the information that you have to prove that the person is not necessarily a good person. And here's why. When you're dealing with judges, you are dealing with a judge who probably has hundreds of cases on their docket, literally hundreds. I know in most counties and most jurisdictions, there are hundreds of cases of divorce cases, new cases filed a day, every single day. And just think about how many family law judges are on the bench in your particular jurisdiction. It might be one, it might be 20, but even if it's you know, 30, and, and there are hundreds or thousands of cases filed a day, those cases are being assigned to those judges on a daily basis. And so those judges are having to deal with thousands of people getting a divorce, thousands. And those cases don't even count the cases where people come back to enforce issues where there might have been a problem before. Somebody's not paying something they're supposed to pay. Somebody's not uh, uh, obeying the, the terms of the agreement or, or, or going along with the terms of the agreement. Or, it, and it doesn't also include any of those um, uh, modification actions. So people who are going back to try to change the parenting plan or try to change the child support or try to change the amount of alimony or anything like that. So enforcement and modifications are not even included in that number that I'm telling you of hundreds or thousands of new divorce cases. So the judges literally are overwhelmed, backed up. They have way too much on their plate, way too many docket, uh, uh, cases on their docket. And judges, by the way, are 
um, evaluated. They're evaluated by the judicial system, and they're also evaluated by the voters who voted them in if, if they were voted in in the first place and not appointed by a, uh, a governor or something like that. But they're still going to be evaluated. They're going to be evaluated on how quickly they get um, cases off of their docket and also how many times they are appealed. So just I give you all of that background because I want you to understand that for those of you who have children, you understand that when your kids, if you have more than one kid and they are fighting with each other and they come at you and they go, he did it, this, he did this to me, she did that to me, she started it, he started it. What's your first reaction gonna be? Your first reaction's gonna be, both of you just stop it. Both of you just get along, just get along. And so most judges, they just don't want to have to deal with it. They hear finger pointing, they see finger pointing, they hear complaints about spouses on a daily basis all the time, and they're like, over it. They just want the case off their docket. And remember, when you do get to go to court, you're going to have a very short window of time to present your case, to look like the, the good one, to be the one that the judge potentially likes better. Remember, judges do apply the law, but they are human beings underneath those black robes. They have biases. They decide they like someone. They decide they believe someone, whatever it is. You get a very short window of time to present your case. And a lot of times people will say to me, I have 50 witnesses that'll show that this person is a bad person. Okay, well, but when you think about that in terms of a realistic presentation to the court, you have to remember that in order to present a witness to the court, you have to have time on that judge's docket. And hours and hours and hours of time on the judge's docket translate to, uh, translates to hours and hours and hours of money and fees that you're spending for your attorney. And if you put 50 witnesses on your witness list, then the other side is gonna to wanna to depose every single one of those witnesses. So when it comes to you know, going in front of a judge and saying, that person's a narcissist, the better way to do it, the judge is just gonna go, okay, they're all narcissists, everybody's a narcissist. That's basically what they're gonna think. So what you need to do is put it in light of something that the judge is actually going to care about, such as custody. If you know the judge has the um, uh, obligation to come up with what's in the best interest of the children, what's going to be the best parenting plan, what's going to be the best custody arrangement, who should have decision-making authority about the children's issues or something like that. And so when they're looking at those things, they're going to go, Okay, um, you know, has this person put the children's needs before their own? Has the person encouraged a relationship between the children and the other parent? Has this person been respectful to the other parent? I'm sure in wherever you live, wherever you are in the world, there is some law around how the judge is going to figure out what's going to be best for the children. So it's gonna be better for you to take a look at those laws, whatever they are, and present evidence in light of those laws that shows that this person is not necessarily a good parent. And you can do that without just saying that person's a narcissist. Now, if you wanna say that person's a narcissist and you, you really want that word to be presented to the judge, then it's going to be better served to do it in the context of either a psychological evaluation or a custody evaluation that's done by a psychological professional or mental health professional who then says, I did psychological testing on these parents and here are the results that I found. And it's going to be in the context of a full-on report that's probably going to be 30 or 40 pages, and it's going to have tons and tons of information and supporting documentation as to how that mental health professional came up with that diagnosis of that person. But even so, remember that narcissism is not illegal, and it is not grounds for 
taking children away from parents. I mean, I know it feels like it should because they're heinous beasts, but the better way for you to attack using the word narcissist or showing narcissistic traits in court is showing why the judge should care about this person's bad traits. So whether it's in the context of you know, property division or maybe it's in the context of showing that they're, they have you know, bad moral character or because they lie all the time, you know, lying is always going to be something that's relevant or, or something within the context of the custody case, that's where you're going to want to use that information that you have about how that person is a narcissist. What are your thoughts on the opposing side's tactic was to leave, set criminal charges, huge published smear campaigns, all for the purpose of separation? Uh, what's your opinion for best defense? Well, you've heard the, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm so sorry of what you're going through. It sounds like you're dealing with a malignant narcissist. Malignant narcissists tend to be the ones who are, um, you know, they don't even care. They have no conscience whatsoever. They'll just go after you and they'll say whatever they need to say. So what I'm going to say to you, Al, is your best defense is a good offense. Uh, for those of you who follow me regularly, you know that I often say that the best football teams, if they have a great defense, then they have nobody scoring any points. So you need to start going on the offensive. This is a person who has gotten you under siege. And that's what narcissists do. Like right out of the gate, they want to take that first swing. They want to make sure that you feel disempowered, that you feel like you can't ever get past all of this. I have had clients who have had criminal charges against them, who haven't seen their children for years. All of this bad stuff has happened to them. And then they come to my office and we get it all turned around. And the reason why I can get it turned around is because I, I, I help them create a strategy which will box them in. Remember when you're talking about a narcissist, the most important thing to them is narcissistic supply. But when you're dealing with a narcissist and you're dealing with that narcissistic supply, remember that the supply that means the most to them is how they look, what people think of them. They want the rest of the world to think that they're wonderful that or that they're the victim and that you're the bad one and they want to get that preemptive strike going in there so they put you on the defensive right away so what you need to do is create a strategy that's going to threaten a source of supply that means more to your spouse to keep than the supply that she's getting from making you miserable. And she's getting lots and lots of supply by watching you squirm, by watching you know her be on top or, or him or whoever it is that's um, on the other side. And so that's what's really going on. And nar the, the beautiful thing about narcissists is that they are so simple to understand. They only want one thing and that's, that's supply. But they go after it in many different ways. But they're actually very, very predictable. They're very predictable in how they will act in, in any kind of a discard phase, but especially when they're dealing with it, somebody in divorce or end of a business partnership or anything like that. They fight dirty. That's what they do. They don't have ethics. They, they just, it, you know, it's the equivalent of the kick in the groin, the pulling of the hair, the biting of the ear, whatever they have to do so that they can come on top. But you can develop a strategy which will allow you to uh, box them in and, and narcissists eventually do self-destruct. If you give them enough rope, they eventually get to a point where they start making mistakes, where they start coming unglued. Um, they'll, they'll act like they're moving forward and they're really good at this magical thinking and moving forward and not seeing their path of destruction behind them. But they will eventually self-destruct if you surround them and put them in a place where they have no choice but to resolve matters with you. And, and that's what I teach in the Slay program. That's what I teach on these videos. That's what I teach in everything that I do because I figured it out. I figured out 
how to negotiate with them in a way that helps you see movement and get where you want to go. I'm going to give you five ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. So you're going to want to make sure you stay till the end. You're going to want to make sure that you save this video. You're going to want to make sure you share it out. You're going to want to make sure that you go ahead and watch it over and over again, because I'm going to give you all the ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. Okay. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to remember the acronym, knock them dead. All right. So D E A D D. So two D's but D-E-A-D-D, -D, knock them dead. So the first D stands for document everything. And I mean everything. You know, you're going to want to journal everything. You're want to, going to want to document everything. In my slave program, I actually have 12 different things that you're going to want to be documenting, but you're going to want to document everything with regard to finances, to your children, if you have children, anything that they do that seems out of the ordinary. I know it's a pain, but you know, if you have a notes app or something, just note it because you're not going to remember. But you know, even if it's crazy, oh, I don't know if I should write that down, but you know, you just never know. And there's many different ways that these things come into play. So you will want to make sure that you document everything, whether it's a business case or a family law case, or it's against a business partner, maybe it's a, a case against an employer or something like that. It always is something that you're going to need to be doing is documenting. Whether it's a timeline form, you end up needing it for the statutes to prove different elements of a statute you definitely need documentation. I also have a podcast where I ended up interviewing one of the people who used my Slay for Biz program, Sharon Scott. I highly recommend that you check that out because she talked about how she used my program and it really helped her a lot. So definitely document everything. The next thing is the E, emotions. Keep them in check. You're definitely going to want to keep your emotions in check. There's so many different reasons that you want to keep your emotions in check. I mean, for one thing is that they want to trigger you constantly. They love to see you squirm. So they get supply from it. And you really don't want to give them narcissistic supply, obviously, because that's no fun. I mean, they just get the satisfaction of seeing you go crazy, right? I mean, why do you want to do that? But then the next thing is that they use your reaction against you. They go, look, there's the crazy one. There's the one that's the problem. And they will use that against you in a number of ways. They use the emails against you, the texts against you. They may even be videotaping against you. They use the witnesses against you, whatever it is. So definitely keep your emotions in check. They use it for custody, so many different things. So definitely E, keep your emotions in check. And it doesn't help you when you're negotiating either, if you're all over the place when it comes to settlements, because then you end up settling for things that you regret two months down the road, three months down the road. You're like, oh, I didn't want to settle for that. Because a lot of times you're like, oh, I just, I just ended up settling for that because I just wanted it to be done. I just wanted it to be over with, or maybe you were just feeling pressured, you know, really try to keep your emotions in check. And by the way, if you're really, really struggling with that, because a lot of times when you're, you've been dealing with a narcissist for a long period of time, you, you are in a trauma state, especially PTSD. Sometimes I do have a partnership with better help. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. I do receive commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any more. We have a partnership with them because I wanted to have a partnership with a service that we could trust, that we could recommend. If you are struggling, go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung so that you can get the help and support that you need if you're having trouble with your emotions and you're having trouble with trauma. So that's the E. The next one is always wear the white hat. That's the A. Always wear the white hat. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that in that you want to be the one if you end up in front of the judge, which that's what this is about. You want to be the one where the judge is like, 
hey, this is the person that obviously is the good one. Let the narcissist be the one who's the one who's badly behaving. A lot of times it's so easy to fall into, hey, they're behaving badly. They're doing things wrong. They did it too. I can do it too. What happens though is then you have a situation where the judge is just like seeing like two kids that are fighting. So for those of you who are, who are out there watching who have children and, and you have more than one, what happens is it, they just are like, oh, both of you just stop it. You know, they don't see that, oh, well, they started it or they're worse. They just see two people who just are fighting. So you want to be the one who's consistently not being in the mud with the other one. Because if you were the one who's what I call always wearing the white hat, who's not engaging, who didn't respond, who didn't get into it, and the other one is always the one who's constantly the badly behaved one, then it makes it really, really obvious who is the the bad one. And, and it's kind of hand in hand with keeping your emotions in check, but it's even one step much, much further than that. You really, really want to be the one who's just always behaving, always doing the right thing. So just kind of imagine that the judge is sort of walking around with you and watching every single thing that you're doing. Always wear the white hat. That's the A. All right. So the next one is don't go anywhere alone. That's the D, the first D in knock them dead. And we're going through all the elements of what to do to beat a narcissist in court. So, you know, this is because they're going to say you followed them, you, you did this, you did that. They lie all the time. So they're constantly going to be saying that you were menacing, that you were threatening, that you did this with the kids or that you touched somebody inappropriately or whatever it is that they make up constantly. And, and then you end up having to defend against these ridiculous claims. So you want to make sure that you have people around as much as you possibly can. If you have children, for example, have your exchanges for custody at daycares, at schools, you know, at shopping plazas or places where people are around because you just don't want situations where they can make things up about what's going on. And in that same vein, by the way, you're going to want to make sure that even depositions are videotaped if possible. And I have actually a whole video on how to beat a narcissist in mediation. I talk about that in there and you should definitely check out that video as well, because a lot of you who are trying to beat a narcissist in court are also mediating with a narcissist and you should definitely check out that video as well. And I also do have a whole video where I interview Judge Lynn Toller. You guys should definitely check out that video too. She was the judge on divorce court for 17 years and her video interview was very, very highly fascinating. So definitely check that out too. And if you guys are so ready to knock them dead, put knock them dead in the comments is I'm so ready to help you knock them dead. And if you've been following along with how to beat a narcissist in court, and you've been following along with my acronym, you know, there's one more D. The last D is decoys. It stands for decoys. And what I mean by decoys is you really do not want to give them your best offer or give them any of your best evidence or show them any of your cards or show them any of your hands until you're ready to unveil it in court or when you're ready. I mean, a lot of times while you're standing on the courthouse steps or even at lunch during the trial, 
they want to settle, they're ready to have settlement talks, or even maybe the eve before trial or a couple of days before, they're ready to have some settlement talks at that point or something. And you might be ready at that point as well, but you've got to have your strategy, your leverage, have anticipated your focus on you, your position, that being on the offensive, my whole slay methodology at that point, you do not give them your best offer. You do not show your best evidence. You decoy the whole thing until you are so ready to go. Basically, the way I look at it is you're building an invisible fence around them until you turn on the lights and they realize, oh my God, I'm totally pinned in. At that point, they have no choice but to resolve the issue with you or resolve the issues with you. So you're appearing weak, you're feigning ignorance, you, you know, oh, I, I don't know, I have no idea. Let them think that they're winning let them go all crazy on you. Allow them to go off. A lot of times that's good for you. It's hard. I know because it's, you don't want them to get away with anything a lot of times during the case, but sometimes if you have an ongoing case, it's good to let them screw up because those little battles that show that they're screwing up help you to demonstrate to the judge who they actually are. So let them do that, you know, because then you can show patterns that they aren't doing what they're supposed to do, show patterns that they're liars, show patterns that they are bad parents or terrible with money or whatever it is that you need to show it actually ends up helping you in the end or that they have anger issues or whatever it is so that definitely helps you sometimes it's it's really really good to feign that you're weak feign that you're ignorant a lot of times by the way you you can pretend like there's a particular thing that you really really want and it's not the thing that you really really want because then, you know, they go after that, you know, because they're going to go after the thing that they think that you really, really want, right? So let them go after that particular thing. So I want to answer this question about how to hold the narcissist feet to the fire and sanctions and, and what to do about that. So first of all, what is a sanction? A sanction is um, a way to punish that narcissist. It's something that only can be issued by a judge, no one else. Um, and sanctions can be in the form of all different kinds of things. It can be in the form of striking their requests, like striking their pleadings. It can be, um, it, it, it can be fees. It can be fines. It could even be you know, jail time, depending on what it is, but it's basically the court gets mad. The court says, Hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. We don't like that. So I judge, I'm going to sanction you. I'm going to punish you by making you do these things. And I'm going to tell you that I, I really don't like what you did. So I'm going to, I'm going to sanction you. So that that's what sanctions are. And sometimes they're statutory and sometimes the judge just imposes them. Statutory means that, you know, if you look up in a particular statute, what the, if there are sanctions for, let's say, not complying with a parenting plan, some states actually have sanctions listed there, things that the judge can choose from to punish somebody if they haven't done what they're supposed to do with regard to that parenting plan. And sometimes they're not statutory. Sometimes the judge just says, you know what? I really don't like what you did. And I don't like the, the, your attitude. I don't like the fact that you have uh, thumb, thumbed your nose at my court order. And so therefore I'm going to impose bad things to happen to you. So it, it can be statutory. It doesn't necessarily have to be. 
But one thing you do need to know and remember is that the only person that has any power over anybody else is the judge, no one else. So, you know, you can't, your lawyer only has so much power, the other person's lawyer, the narc's lawyer only has so much power. And, you know, a lot of times people say to me, how come his or her lawyer doesn't tell them that their behavior is bad. Well, you you don't know what conversations are going on between that narcissist and that narcissist lawyer, number one. And number two, sometimes narcissists pick lawyers that are just happy to do whatever they tell them to do. And a lot of times lawyers uh, don't want to get fired. So they'll just go along with whatever the narcissist wants them to do. I often say that narcissists and, and, and their lawyers are kind of like owners with their dogs. You know, they kind of usually find one that kind of looks like them or is at least willing to toe the line and say what they want them to say. So um, a lot of times, you know, once you get a court order into place, you know, let's say it's for something um, pretty benign, like that they're supposed to provide documents by a certain date or time that, you know, that they were supposed to provide financial documents, bank statements, credit card statements, something like that. And um, there's, and, and there's a court order in place that says you're supposed to provide them by a certain date. Let's say it's, you know, September 30th or something like that. And September 30th comes and goes, and then they still haven't provided the documents. And the first words out of your mouth are going to be, how are they getting away with this? How is this happening? Well, you know, no one's standing in people's living rooms. You know, there's not, there's no like police out there that stand there and go, oh, it's September 30th. This has gone by. You didn't do it. You know, so how does it get enforced? The only way it gets enforced is you, if you're representing yourself or your lawyer, has to go back to the, the court, has to go back to that only person that has power, which is the judge. So they have to file something. And, and so, you know, I don't necessarily know what it's called uh, in your particular state or country or jurisdiction, but it's going to be some kind of of pleading or, or motion or something that they can file to go back to the court and say, your honor, this person did not do what they were, were ordered to do according to your court order. So now please do something about it. And now the court can say, okay, I can hold you in contempt or something like that. And once they find that that person is in contempt of court, meaning I just did whatever the hell I wanted and I thumbed my nose at your court order. I had the ability to um, to, to uh, comply with your court order. I just willingly decided I don't really care and I'm not going to do it. That That's what the judge has to find that that person felt. So, you know, a lot of times there's a, a conversation around whether the person had the ability to comply with the court order. People will say, I didn't have the ability to pay. And so, you know, the, the court has to find, you know, did, did does that person have the ability to purge their contempt? Do they have the ability to, you know, was it willful? Um, and, you know, so there's always conversation around that. But once you get all the way down to that point, you know, then you can get into some sanctions and, and say, you know, hey, you should have complied with this court order. You didn't. You didn't even, you had the ability, nothing was stopping you from complying with this court order. And so, therefore, I'm going to go ahead now and, um, and sanction you. And so, and, and sanctions, a lot of times in civil court, which is what family court is, it, it's in the form of money, fines, things like that. Attorney's fees is a really easy way to uh, sanction or fine somebody. Um, and, and sometimes if it's like that they were supposed to pay something and they didn't, um, they can sanction them by adding on um, interest, something like that. 
when it comes to support obligations like child support, courts usually don't mess around with that. Uh, child support sanctions can be pretty darn harsh. It, you know, that's where they will actually attach pay stubs, take driver's licenses, maybe put a flag on your passport so you can't leave, uh, you know, uh, sometimes even incarceration. So, um, you know, especially with child support, that's where courts really get pretty aggressive with um, with their sanctions because courts, you know, have, they don't want children to become wards of the state. They want people to do what they're supposed to do when, when, with, with regard to children. So um, just make sure that your lawyer, it, it, you know, most lawyers don't understand narcissism. So, you know, a lot of times when it, early on, if the narcissist do, didn't, you know, provide the documents they were supposed to, they, you know, sometimes they're required to send a letter, you know, try to work it out with the other lawyer before they can do anything. So you have to respect that that sometimes is required. But once your lawyer has satisfied anything with regard to that, you got to stay on your lawyer about staying on them. Because if you just give a little bit to a narcissist, they think they're winning. They think they're getting away with it. Um, and, and one of the things I want to say to all of you is that when you are a victim of narcissistic abuse, which a lot of us who've been narcissist victims are empathic people, kind people, good people, generous people, open-hearted people. It's not natural for, or, or doesn't feel necessarily comfortable going on the offensive and, and just being as aggressive as you can possibly be in the court system. But that's what you have to do when it comes to dealing with a narcissist. And I, I talk a lot about that in my SLAY program um, and, and, and in my free webinar. So if you haven't checked out my free webinar, you should definitely do that because I talk more about all of this in that. Um, because you, you can't let the narcissist get away with anything. And that's why I created the SLAY program, because I wanted you to all to understand that 99.9% .9 of lawyers don't understand narcissism. So you can have a fantastic lawyer, but they still may not, I mean, you can spend $100,000 and not get anywhere. I hear those stories all the time. And people think, why aren't I getting anywhere? How come I'm not why am I spending all this money and we're still spinning our wheels? Why am I spending all this money and we're still like, they haven't done what they're supposed to do. They're still getting away with it. They're still not, they're still ignoring court orders. You just have to be on their butt all the time. As soon as they did, didn't do something that they were supposed to do, you have to be right on them. Because as I said at the beginning of this video, narcissists get supply from jerking you around in the court system. So, you know, you have to make it so that they don't really enjoy it anymore, that they're not getting supply from it anymore. The minute that they've ignored a court order and, and your lawyer has just let it pass by and, and, and you, or, or you, if you're representing yourself, you know, hasn't filed something in the court system that, to say, hey, motion for contempt, motion to enforce, motion to compel. Um, set it for hearing right away. Be, you know, just let the judge know right away that this person is thumbing their nose at the court system. And judges don't like that. They want people to to be in, you know, respecting their court orders. And so you, you have to kind of stay right on them about that. So why am I talking about quantum law and karma and all of these things when I am a lawyer? I'm going to tell you why right now, because mindset is 50% of winning a negotiation and intention is a huge part of that. 80% of a negotiation is won before you even walk into the room. It because, because it comes to your planning and preparation, yes, of course, but it is a huge part 
of it is your, is your mindset. It is one of the most important parts of it. And mindset also has to do with your thoughts and your thoughts are energy. And what quantum law says is that what, whatever energy you're putting out there, that's the energy that you're going to get like attracts like it's just physics. Okay. And so when you are like forming a thought in your mind and you're placing that thought out into the world, you are basically placing an order to the universe. And you're saying to the universe, this is what I want to have happen. This is how I want it to go. So if you say things to the universe, like I'm never going to get that he or she always gets their way. I can never win. I'm not even going to try to get this particular thing because it's never going to happen. The universe goes, okay, because whatever your little beams of thought are, that energy that you place out into the world, that's what comes back to you. Your thoughts are literally just protons, neutrons, and electrons, and ions, all just floating around in your brain. That's all they are. You can't feel them. You can't touch them. As fast as they come into your brain, they can go back out of your brain. Let's just try an experiment right now. I want you to think about I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about a white picket fence. Just hold that in your mind. Now let it go. Is it, is it still there? No, it's not. It's gone. And, and it's the same thing with your thoughts. The only thing is when you start to have beliefs, that just means that it's a thought that you've thought over and over and over again. And now it's become a belief. And now you just believe that it's true but it's only because you've been thinking it so many times that it becomes like true to you, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily true. If you want to know more about power thinking, when it comes to narcissists, make sure to check out my video called power thinking when it comes to narcissists, because making sure you have a powerful mind is going to be so, so important. So what happens when you're when you're harnessing the power of quantum law is you're basically lining up the, the, the power of the universe to say, this is how I want it to go. You're, 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 it's almost like you're putting, you're setting your GPS and you know, if you're driving from Los Angeles to San Diego and you don't know how to get there, you're going to put a thing in your GPS and you're just going to assume that you're going to drive there. At no point do you go, well, maybe I'm going to get there. My, maybe it's going to happen. Maybe not. You know, maybe I'll end up in, in, you know, Oregon or something like that. You don't think that, right? But that's what we do with our thoughts. We go, okay, well, I I think I'd like this to happen, but maybe it won't. Maybe I'll end up over here. Maybe I'll end up over there. You can't, You can't do that when you are harnessing the power of quantum law because, you know, the, the universe of, of physics is such that it will respond to exactly what you put out there. Like attracts like that is a physics law. And so you're thoughts are going to beam out into the energy and whatever it is that you put out there is going to come back to you. So the first step in actually beating that narcissist is believing that you can and not only believing it, but knowing it with every cell of your body that this is how it's going, no matter what. This is the direction that it's going to head. I am going to receive this. I am going to let them know that I am more powerful. They are going to see that they are no longer the more powerful one, that they are no longer the one who's controlling me. I am the one who's in control. I am the one who's in control of my thoughts, my life, my outcomes. And then that's how it ends up going to go. The universe wants to respond to you. It it absolutely is at the ready. It's like the soldiers who are just, as soon as you clap, boom, there they are. What would you like? 
but you have to let them know what it is. Because if you say, I'm never going to win, I shouldn't even bother to try, then that's how it's going to go. And the other thing that's really, really important is that you need to make sure that you are not saying things to the, the, the universe that's going to make the universe believe that you're not in control. And by saying things like, I'm a victim, I can never win, or I need a good lawyer, or somebody else has to help me, or I need more money, or all of those kinds of things. You're basically saying to the universe, I don't have it now. I'm not in control. I can't do it. The way things are now, it's not going to happen. And then that's what's going to happen. You've placed that, that order to the universe. So if you are a winner and you're changing your mindset to be a mindset of a winner, then I want to see I'm a winner in the comments right now. Go ahead, write it. I'm a winner. I want you to start saying that to yourself over and over and over again. That's your mantra. I am a winner. I uh, recently read a book called Untamed by Glennon Doyle, which was really, really great, especially if you're a woman. I don't know, maybe guys would like it too, but um, it was really a good book. And one of the things that she said was her mantra in that book was, uh, I can do hard things. And, you know, at first I was like, I don't know, I can do hard things. Is that a good mantra? And then I started to like think, think about it. It was like, okay, now, yeah, if, if I'm getting ready to do something that maybe feels like a challenge or maybe I'm afraid of, then, you know, just say to yourself, I can do hard things. Um, and another one that I read one time was a book by uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. And I think the book was Big Love. Um, and we'll make sure we drop links to these books down below if you want to check them out. Um, no obligation, but you, if you want to check them out, you can. Um, and it, anyway, the book in the book Big Love, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about fear. And she talks about how anytime she does something new, she used to say, oh, I have to get rid of fear. I, I can't have fear come with me no matter what, you know, I, I, I've got to figure out a way to like get rid of it. Well, but the truth is that none of us ever completely figure out a way to operate into a new world or a new thing without any fear whatsoever. The courage is doing it in the face of fear, right? Like the cowardly lion in, in, in The Wizard of Oz. And so what Elizabeth Gilbert says in that book is that she has learned to go, okay, and, and like have a conversation with fear and say, all right, fear, we're going on a trip, we're doing this thing, and we're gonna get in the car, and you know, I understand that you're gonna have to come along. I would like for you not to come along, but I understand that you're coming along against my wishes, so okay, fine, fear, you get to come, but you definitely do not get to drive. You have to sit in the back seat. I'm driving. You don't get to drive. You don't get to navigate. You definitely do not even get to touch the radio. You don't get to touch, play the songs. You just have to sit there and shut up while I'm doing this thing and I'm driving. So fear you're coming, but I'm driving. And I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy. So if you want to use quantum law to beat that narcissist, the thing you have to do is start with your thoughts. Start like pinging into the universe. Remember, like attracts like. So what you ping out pings right back to you. It's like a boomerang. So if you want good things to start coming to you, you better start being very, very aware of the things that you're pinging out into the universe so that the right things start pinging back to you. And that's the way you're going to start the path of beating that narcissist. Her lawyer is wanting mediation, but I don't want to give it away anymore. What are your thoughts? So my thoughts are this. When you go to a mediation with a narcissist, 
Yeah, and you can settle a case in mediation with a narcissist, by the way. A lot of people say don't bother mediation or don't bother trying to settle a case with a narcissist. It never works. And every time I see that, I think, no, that's not true. I've had many, many narcissists settle in mediation. But the key is that when you go to mediation with the narcissist, you can't just walk in and think you're going to talk it through and resolve differences because there's one key element that's missing when you're dealing with a narcissist in mediation. And that is they don't actually really want to settle the case because they get narcissistic supply from jerking you around. So how do you get them to settle a case in mediation? Well, you have to have a super strong strategy and you have to have created enough leverage that when you get to that mediation, they feel motivated and squeezed and incentivized into settling the case. That's what I teach people how to do with my slay system and my slay program. Strategy, leverage, anticipate what the narcissist is going to do and focus on your case and you and creating an offensive position. So, but leverage is really, really key. So the mistake that people make a lot of times when they go into a mediation with a narcissist is that they think that they're dealing with, you know, a, a, a reasonable person, or you just think, oh, it's perfunctory. The court's making me do it. So let's just get this over with. And hopefully the mediator will be able to help. And hopefully the lawyers will be able to help. And and it just ends up being a really super expensive conversation that doesn't really get you anywhere. So yes, you should mediate. And here's why. Because when you go to mediation, if you get them to set, sign a settlement agreement in mediation, then the case is done. If you go to court and you go before a judge and the judge hands down a decision, then that decision is appealable. So you could win 100% of everything that you want in court and still not be done because they can appeal that. And even worse, they can file a motion to stay the orders, meaning whatever you want in that final judgment is just going to be held in limbo and you're not going to get to enjoy the fruits of that until after the appeal is done. Appeals take a long time and they're very expensive. Now, oftentimes appeals aren't um, successful. Most of the time, people who appeal don't prevail. I mean, it's like a 15% win rate or something if you're appealing. But even so, you're still dealing with this person. So it is definitely better to try to get them to sign an agreement. But don't go back and forth with between your attorneys to try to get them to sign an agreement. You definitely want them to sign in mediation when all these people are around them, the mediator, the, the, the other lawyers. Because one of the things about narcissists is that they desperately do not want to look bad in front of people that they respect and especially the judge. So if you get to mediation and you've got all your leverage ready to go and, and all of these bits of information that they're realizing is going to come out if they end up in front of a judge or that they're, they're, they might end up with a bad result or something like that. That's how you squeeze them into settling a case at mediation. So I do recommend that you try to mediate again. And um, PR, I just, it's kind of a long way of answering a question, but I thought it was a really good one and a great opportunity for me to tell you why I think mediation is a good idea, even if you're dealing with a narcissist, and sometimes especially if you're dealing with a narcissist, because that's where your leverage is going to be the best, um, because all narcissists are driven by supply, and, all, and a big piece of that supply is how they look in front of people. So looking bad in front of a judge or maybe having information come out about them that's public, that they don't want to um, come out about them um, is a really, really nice form of, of 
kind of manipulating, ethically manipulating the manipulator into signing an agreement. So I call it an ethical manipulation because you're just taking information that you have and using it against them. And all narcissists are liars and do things that you can definitely use against them. So, you know, you're just trying to get back to what's fair. A lot of people say, I, I don't want to fight. I, I don't want to spend a lot of money. If you feel that way, then you've got to create leverage. Now, if you're getting ready to go to court with the narcissist, whether it's divorce court or otherwise, you're going to want to be fully prepared and you're definitely not going to want to walk in without having the best possible strategies and tactics at your fingertips because this is going to be no cakewalk. The narcissist is going to make it as difficult for you as possible. So stay tuned and listen to the end so that you can get all the tips and you'll be all ready to go. All right, number one. Number one is have everything that's possible to be in writing be in writing because narcissists by their nature are pathological liars. So they are going to lie about things that you said, you didn't say, conversations that took place or didn't take place, what they said or didn't say, whatever it is, it's going to be twisted, it's going to be, be, be manipulated. So you wanna make sure that you can keep everything in writing to the extent that that's possible. So, and, and ideally it would be like in an email or something like that where you actually have um, the time stamp on it, you have the date stamp on it, you have the email, who it came from, the email address of who it came from, who it went to, that sort of thing. Text messages are admissible in court nowadays, but it's just a little bit more difficult to authenticate them when it comes to evidence in court. So it is better if you can do it via email if possible. The other problem with text messages is that they tend to go away after a certain period of time. Um, and especially if you don't save them, it's really difficult to go back and find them. The, the phone companies don't even really keep them either. So you're definitely going to, going to want to make sure that you use email if possible. If you're co-parenting, having a co-parenting app such as Talking Parents or FAIR or uh, Our Family Wizard, something like that is always a good idea too. I mean, the bottom line is that they're going to try to get you away from this writing. They don't want to be in writing because they know that it will box them in and narcissists don't want to be boxed in. So they're going to do whatever they can to get you to meet with them, to, um, to go against what you said before, things like that. They're, they're just, you know, let's just meet. We don't need the writing. We don't need um, all these other people around us. You know, let's just uh, meet at Starbucks or whatever. And, and the reason why they're doing that is to get you into a place where they can manipulate you again. So by keeping everything in writing as much as possible, um, you can minimize that problem. Now, what the flip side of this, by the way, is for you to remember that every single writing is a potential trial exhibit. So if you don't wanna see it again, then don't put it in writing. The way I just say it to people is, you know, just imagine the judge is, is leaning over your shoulder and watching you write that text or that email. And before you hit send, say, you know, judge, your honor, is this something that you would want to see? And if it's not, then you don't want to send it. Okay, the second thing that you're going to want to do is use video for depositions. And the reason why you're going to want to do this, and yes, it's a little bit more expensive. You have to pay for the court reporter. Now you have to pay for the videographer. But it goes back again to boxing that narcissist in. If you box them in enough, then they will act like the spoiled temper tantrum child and their true colors will show up and you'll be able to use that against them down the road. So, but, you know, it, just trying to control their behavior using video will definitely help because if you don't use video, what they tend to do is do things that don't show up on the record, meaning the court reporter will take down everything that's actually said in the deposition. When you look at the deposition transcript, it'll, it'll just say question, blah, 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 answer, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing around it. There's no description given around it. 
So if that narcissist is giving you dirty looks, making faces, all the things that they do, and they do, then um, it, nothing is taken down. Now, for me as a lawyer, there have been many times where I've had to say, let the record reflect that so-and-so is making faces at so-and-so. But, you know, how many times can the lawyer do that over and over again without just constantly interrupting the deposition? So by videoing it, you actually see what, um, how they're responding and how they're acting. Plus, it makes them behave a little bit better because they're a little less likely to be a complete jackass if there's a video shining in their face. If this is all sounding really good to you so far, put a thumbs up in the comments. Okay, number three, it's focus on your own case. So this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see lawyers make. I see lots and lots of people make because it's just natural to want to focus on what's the other side doing and, and all of their flaws and all of their mistakes and how is he or she getting away with this and look at how badly they're behaving and isn't the judge going to see that? And, and the answer is maybe and probably, and yeah, you will want to bring out all of the other bad behavior of the other side. But, you know, just like in football, if you all you have is a good defense and you have no offense whatsoever, then you never score any points, right? So you want to make sure that your case is as strong as possible. Focus on your case. Make, the, make sure that the facts and the supporting documentation and everything is done to create your case and make sure it's super strong. And then for the other side, you create that leverage to help motivate them into wanting to come to the table to potentially have a settlement conversation with you. Or, you know, you have all the points that make them look bad. Yes, you know, anything that shoots their credibility you know, it, it, when people say, oh, how are they getting away with this? They're lying all the time. Why, how are they getting away with this? So the thing I want you to remember, here's a good reality check for you. And that is who would stop them from getting away with something? The only person who has any power over another human being in the court system is the judge, not the lawyers, not you not family members, no one has the power to order someone to do anything other than the judge. And how do you get in front of the judge? Through motions, through hearings, through trials, things like that. Things have to be filed in the court system and then you have to have a hearing, bring it to the judge's attention, and only at that point can you potentially rein in their behavior. But while you're waiting for that time to get in front of the judge, you're just documenting, you're keeping track, keeping track, keeping track. So that's how you're building your case. If you're dealing with a child custody uh, situation, for example, and the person just never shows up to, to get the kids, or they show up late, or they constantly change the time, you just document it, document it, document it. And then when it comes time to present that to the court, you have a nice log of exactly what happened and when, what time did they show up, what time did, did they leave, you know, all of that. So eventually it will work in your favor. But just remember that you want to keep track of your own case and, and make sure that that is bolstered as much as possible and then highlight the weaknesses of the other person as well. Okay. Number four is what I started to allude to in number three, which is document, document, document. And I cannot stress this enough. Keep really careful notes. Have an app open on your phone. Have um, a journal, a log, whatever you need to do so that wherever you are, real time, you can be logging what's happening. And I have won entire cases on these types of logs. Let me tell you, they do work it is critically important so make sure that you're documenting because what you're doing is you're slowly closing in on your narcissist from every angle it's it's you know it, it this is war this is the art of war and so you're you're building these tactics and and you're closing in on them from various different angles and it doesn't look like you're doing much until you've got them fully surrounded 
And that's when you realize, hey, I, I have them. And only then is when they're going to want to start to have a conversation with you about potentially settling the case um, and not having to go to court. Because you, you know that the main thing about a narcissist is that they don't want to look back. I have a lot more on this in my videos on how to negotiate with a narcissist and how to negotiate with a narcissist ex. And I will drop links below to those videos. You'll definitely want to check those out. Okay, number five, definitely do very thorough research. Have everything ready to go. Do you need appraisals? Do you need valuations? Do you need a forensic accountant? Do we need to figure out what the person's true income is by looking at their bank, bank records? Do we need to figure out a lifestyle analysis by looking at credit card statements and bank statements and things like that? Everything needs to be ready to go, all I's dotted, all T's crossed. Don't leave any stone unturned. Don't leave anything to winging it because whatever your weaknesses are, wherever there, there's that weakness in your case, that's where they're going to find you. And that's where they're going to jam their foot in and open that door and make it into a big, huge thing. So also in being prepared, you're going to want to make sure that you do all the research for the other side. What are they going to argue? What points do they have against me? What leverage do they have against me? And then be ready to answer that. I anticipated this argument and here's my response because if you're only prepared for your side, then you are only half ready to go. So make sure that you are ready for both sides as if you're preparing for both sides. And one word about leverage, by the way, is make sure that once you've got that leverage, you use it at the most opportune time. Do not give it away too early. Do not show it to them before you get to court because you want to use it when you need it. All right, so the last one, number six, is to keep your emotions in check. And this is going to be one of the hardest things to do because narcissists know how to push your buttons and they know how to manipulate you. So they're going to make faces, they're going to make little snarky comments, they're gonna say things under their breath. And, um, you know, so I would totally avoid making eye contact with them in the courtroom it's not going to serve you just look at the judge when you're when you're testifying just look at the judge make sure, sure that you've practiced your testimony i as an attorney go over my direct testimony with my clients if your attorney doesn't do that as a matter of course ask your attorney to do that with you um, or ask them for the questions and have somebody else practice it with you you want to just be able to at least control the parts that you can control, which is your direct testimony. You should basically know what those questions are going to be. The, 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 your attorney will be asking you those questions and um, be ready with what you're going to say so that you're not stumped and you're not feeling nervous and, and anxious. You know exactly, okay, this is that question. Here's how I, I planned to respond to it. I mean, of course, you're going to answer truthfully. You just want to be prepared on how you're going to, to uh, word your answers, how you're going to say it, what things you want to make sure to get in, what things you want to make sure to say, things like that. So, um, so that's uh, your direct testimony. Now, as for your cross-examination, you should also see if your lawyer, I, I know I usually do this as a matter of course, I tell my clients what to expect for cross-examination too. Um, I even sometimes get another lawyer in my office to do a mock cross-examination with the person and sort of beat them up a little bit, just so that they're ready. You know, the kinds of questions that I would ask under cross-examination, something like that. So the more you can be prepared, the less emotional you will be, the less anxious you will be. 